Hi, welcome to Happenings. I'm Helen Moriarty. On this show, Mary Woodward, art historian and lead guide at the Gropius House, will present an illustrated lecture on the Bauhaus School of Art, noted for 100 years of modern designs for a modern world. For nearly 100 years, Bauhaus was an interactive school of art and architecture. Founded in Germany in 1919 with a basic attendance of simplicity and efficiency. The German architect Walter Gropius was the man most associated with the Bauhaus. Gropius continued to expand the Bauhaus design principles as he moved from Germany to England and then to teach at Harvard University and live in Massachusetts. His home in Lincoln, completed in 1938, was a world-recognized gym, a brilliant expression of his stated mission, modern designs for a modern world. Come with me to listen to Mary Woodward present her lecture on the Bauhaus. And the man associated with the Bauhaus, its creator and first director, German architect Walter Gropius. So in our talk today, we're going to explore Gropius's life from his earliest building project in Germany which has a New England connection, through to the end of his life, where before his death in 1969, he lived for um, 30 years comfortably and stylishly in a home of his own unique design in Lincoln, Massachusetts. The Bauhaus was a creative, interactive, collaborative school of art and architecture founded in Germany in 1919. And as I say, for nearly 10 years, Gropius oversaw the development and the evolution of the Bauhaus. It didn't stay the same from the beginning to its end. Their basic tenets, however, remained simplicity, efficiency, and um, really a lack of ornament that became the foundation of all things modern in the 20th century. Gropius devised the word Bauhaus from two German words, Bau meaning to build, and house meaning house. And so it was literally house of building or house of construction. Gropius continued to expand the Bauhaus design principles as he moved from Germany to England and then finally to live here in Massachusetts. His home in Lincoln, completed in 1938, is a world-recognized architectural gem. It's the embodiment, really, of his mission, which was to bring New England architecture into the 20th century. During this talk, we're going to see many images inside the home, and um, I am the lead guide there. I work for Historic New England, and right now I'll just go ahead and welcome you all to come. We are open all year round. During the winter, we're open in the, on the weekends. Tomorrow's a little iffy, but um, <laughs> generally the weekends. Uh, and the information about the house and its opening is up here on the table as well. So let's start with a little background about how and when modern architecture began and how it was so different from what was being done at the time. Uh, what was popular in Europe and America in the late 1800s were a series of styles uh, that can be called historical revival styles. We have an excellent example of that in downtown Boston. It's Trinity Church, built by Henry Hobson Richardson in the 1870s. There's the interior. It's reminiscent, of course, of medieval churches built in Europe in the 1100s. Uh, let this shot, by the way, because it's being reflected uh, in uh, what's to come, the future. Some scholars, though, see that modern architecture really got its start, in a way, as far back as the 1850s. This building was the Crystal Palace, built outside of London in 1851. And the reason this is cited as maybe one of the first modern buildings is because of it, it was made of steel and iron that was left exposed, not hidden among walls or columns, but left exposed. Uh, this building, though, was a temporary building, and that's where you start to see the first moves towards modernism, often in commercial or temporary buildings. Here was another step forward. 
Perhaps you've heard the phrase, form follows function. Well, you might be surprised to learn that that phrase was coined in the year 1896. American architect Louis Sullivan actually said, form ever follows function, but that doesn't roll off the tongue quite the same. <laughs> so form follows function became the slogan for modernism. And what it means is that the shape of the building relates to its purpose, and its purpose, or the way it's organized, is easily ascertained from looking at the building from the exterior. This is the Carson Peary Scott Building, built in Chicago, finished in 1899. It's made with a steel frame, and the steel frame tells us exactly how the rooms are divided and how many floors there are but he covered the steel frame with terracotta, white terracotta panels. So you don't see the exposed beam the way you would have at, if we were all alive and able to see the Crystal Palace. And furthermore, he didn't just cover it with the white terracotta panel, but it's a panel that's highly decorated, foliate flower designs, so leaves and flowers on the inside and the edges of every single one of those windows there. And this is the entrance right down here. And if you can see that, you can't get any flowerier than that. <laughs> That's just the epitome of foliate design right there. So there were some modern aspects to Louis Sullivan's building, but we're not going to call it modern yet. Now, his disciple was Frank Lloyd Wright. He built the Roby House in 1909. And you can see by the plan of it, he's clustered blocks of living space and open space around a central mass. So the central mass being the chimney here. Uh, it's very forward thinking there, but however with Frank Lloyd Wright's projects, and this he had a very long career, but it's true throughout his projects, he still retains an interest in surface design. He still wants to decorate the surfaces, whether it's with pre-Columbian images from his works in the Southwest, or stylized flowers for his works out in California, or this brickwork, which often includes Romanesque arches. So he's not letting go of those old historical styles yet, even though he's made a big movement towards modern architecture. So simply put, I would say that modernism doesn't really coalesce until, into a movement until we see Walter Gropius come along, making him really one of the most influential architects of the 20th century. He was born the first son of an, into an architecture family in 1883 and in Berlin. And both his father and his uncle were involved in architecture. He went to work in um, 1908 for uh, a very influential German architect named Peter Behrens. And at the time, Peter Behrens was also nudging that needle a little bit closer to modernism. Uh, Peter Behrens was doing primarily commercial work. So again, we start to see some of these movements, these big steps in commercial <coughs> or temporary buildings. Peter Behrens collected uh, some, a very talented crew of assistants. In addition to uh, Walter Gropius, he also had working with him Ludwig Mies van der Rohe and Le Corbusier. So those three young men were together at the same time in Peter Behrens' workshops. And it was there, actually, in 1911 that they had an opportunity to learn about Frank Lloyd Wright's work. And the reason was this. In 1911, Frank Lloyd Wright undertook the publication uh, the very first time of a portfolio of his architectural drawings. He gathered 100 of his drawings, and they were published. But they were published first in Germany. And so in addition to this being available, uh, Le Corbusier apparently owned a copy of the portfolio. It was probably pretty pricey, but he could afford it. So. Uh, in addition to you imagining these young architects and their uh, drawings, and they were published, but they were published first in Germany. And so in addition to this being available, uh, Le Corbusier apparently owned a copy of the portfolio. It was probably pretty pricey, but he could afford it. So uh, 
uh, in addition to you imagining these young architects and their um, the shoe manufacturer was in New England and the shoe lasts were being created in this factory in Germany. So what Gropius did was create a very, very modern building. What it demonstrates is the simplicity of form, it's a lack of ornament, and truly a lack of any historical references. This doesn't look like a Greek temple, it doesn't look like a Romanesque church. It's made of uh, brick and steel and glass, and the steel panels are actually masked here by those brick columns. But what is left unmasked and completely open and almost appears to be floating is this wonderful staircase right at the corner, surrounded or encased really in nothing but open space and glass. Okay? Well, that element alone is a significant contribution to modern architecture. And my proof is this picture from a magazine from about two months ago. This is a brand new building built in uh, Marymount University, I think it's in Virginia, Northern Virginia, and this is their staircase. So they know exactly what they're doing. They've got a predecessor from 108 years ago to look at right here, and know that this is how we want to create that open space and that apparent flying staircase. By the way, Gropius was uh, also very forward thinking when it came to designing this workspace because it was a factory for workers. And what he paid special attention to were also very modern sounding ideas, light, air, ventilation. He wanted the space inside the building to be comfortable for the workers and he knew that that would impact their productivity. By the way, you know, we've all heard of LEED certified buildings. They've been around for a few years now. But there is, since about 19, since uh, 2013 or so, there's been a new designation called well buildings. And that's exactly that, buildings that not are just energy efficient, that's what LEED uh, focuses on, but are uh, more conducive to the humans that live and work inside those buildings. So Gropius was very forward thinking in that regard. He also wanted this building, he had, not only, he had an old building and what he was really doing was redesigning it, but he wanted to pay attention to every aspect and every side of the building, including the side that faces the train tracks. So alongside this building, there's an industrial train track that runs by and it's a commuter rail as well. And he wanted to be sure that the building looked beautiful and modern and exquisite <coughs> from a speeding train. And this was a new consideration, really, for architects, and it shows his interest in the modern world. So the Foggus Shoeless Factory was a huge success for Gropius, but his architectural career was interrupted by World War I. He went to serve his country as a cavalry officer. And you're gonna ask me what in the world is he sitting or standing on? It looks like the remains of a bunker. Uh, and he's perched way up here, and here's this fellow over here, you know. Uh, Gropius was a very dashing figure. As a cavalry officer, it meant that he was often horseback riding, and it led to a lifelong love of horses for him. But he was injured uh, on more than one occasion during the war as a result of uh, shrapnel and other uh, warfare. And so um, it was a serious and somber experience uh, for Gropius, as it was, of course, for anybody who was involved in the war. After the war, Gropius, like many people who had been affected by it personally, felt that it was time to stop doing things the way they had always been done and to do things differently. And for Gropius, that meant the architecture world. So in 1919, 100 years ago, Gropius was 35 years old when he was asked to be the director of the Academy of Fine Arts in the town of Weimar, Germany. And uh, one of his first decisions, which was startling, but he's on a new page now in his life, was to merge the School of Fine Arts with the existing School of Arts and Crafts in town. 
For Gropius, there was to be no distinction between the fine arts, which we consider painting, sculpture, drawing, and the crafts or the applied arts like pottery and, and woodworking and uh, metalsmithing. So he really wanted to bring those two together and blur any distinctions between in people's minds about the creation of high and low art. Uh, as one author describes it, the ideal of the reformer Gropius was that painters, sculptors, architects, and craftsmen from various disciplines should work together in a total, new total architecture, is what they called it. So the Bauhaus, we know that was a new word he's created for house of construction or house of building. But interestingly enough, Gropius was also influenced by some threads of medievalism in his work, because, or at least in his structure of the Bauhaus, let's say. Because the, he was also influenced by an older German term called Bauhütte, the name was, and what Bauhütte referenced were the workshops and the living spaces that medieval craftsmen built right up against the edge of the cathedral where they were working, and they might be there for years, right? Take stonemason, might be working his whole career doing, you know, 173 angels for the edge of the cathedral. So this is what I took in England a couple of years ago in Hereford Cathedral. But Balhuta is the name for that. And this idea of a craftsman living and working within the realm of his um, whole domain, his whole world, was something that appealed to Gropius. Uh, <clears throat> And some of his ideas for organizing the Bauhaus actually harken back to medieval apprentice systems as well. So we'll find out more about that. These were ideas then he put forth um, in a manifesto, which he wrote about his new uh, school. It was meant to provide a way to educate young people in art and in life. Uh, these were young people who he felt would, uh, who he gathered together at the Bauhaus, we felt really were going to design the future of Germany. They were the future of what would happen in the country. And many of the young people on their side of it, for their own concerns, came to the Bauhaus looking for just that thing. They were believing that they could bring about social change by bringing about a change in the arts. <clears throat> Now, we, most of us have, uh, if we've ever had an art history class, our textbook was Janssen. Let me read you what Janssen says about architects, modern architects. He says, the leaders of modern architecture have characteristically been vigorous and articulate thinkers in whose minds architectural theory is closely linked with the ideas of social reform. And, and so it was with Grobius. In fact, this is what he himself, Gropius, wrote in 1923. He said, the responsibility of the Bauhaus consists in forming, I love that word, human beings who recognize the world in which they live. And the, the celebration here is of a new type of building, a new type of social and creative unity. If you know about the building of cathedrals, of course, it was not a uh, 10 or 15 year project, but it could last hundreds of years, involving the entire community and many generations of that community. And that kind of social enterprise and unity that it took to build a medieval cathedral is what Gropius is talking about, what he wants to put into the Bauhaus. What he said, what Gropius said of this image was that um, he says, let us together build a new building, create a new building of the future, and it will be everything in one form. He says, the three stars represent the disciplines of architecture, sculpture, and painting. So even though he's using these very medieval ideas for some aspects of his creation of the Bauhaus, he also said, right at the very same time, we want an architecture adapted to our world of machines, radios, and fast cars. <laughs> so they took what was familiar to them in the way of structuring a, an apprentice system and focusing community, but they wanted to project it outward into the modern world. The students were all modern, 
<laughs> the students, men and women alike, all had to take the same sort of fundamental course when they came to the Bauhaus, the preliminary course, they called it. And, and they trained in workshops. They really got their hands dirty. It wasn't just uh, art history slide lectures, but they really were doing the work. The classes were also, in addition to, to architecture, sculpture, and painting, which were the three stars up there, they also held classes in carpentry, weaving, um, glass blowing, pottery, wall painting, stage design, printmaking, and book binding. Gropius wanted to create, and did create, an atmosphere that wasn't stiff and structured, but was free for experimentation. Uh, it was non-academic. It was non-traditional. Uh, and it was also a democratic community uh, where the masters, the professors, as well as the students, have a say in things. Gropius referred to the students uh, as his beehive. And I think that gives you a good image of the kind of activity and productivity that he was expecting. At any time, there were between 120 and 200 students. And for the most part, they usually broke down into about half men and half women. The Bauhaus focused its direction. Earlier in the first sentence or two, I said he managed the evolution of the Bauhaus. It didn't stick uh, with just one thing. And by 1923, he was really working towards creating designs that could be replicated, mass produced, in a modern world uh, that would be still very beautiful and carry forth their ideas, but not just one little beautiful thing at a time, but mass produced beautiful things. So that same year, the summer, and they come out of these first years while the Bauhaus was in their first home in Weimar, Germany. You may have seen this, but oh, before I go, let's just, as I say this, let me just say, before I go, before we look at this, what the Bauhaus then was really doing was creating uh, a new aesthetic around new materials, new technologies, and new lives. When it sold, it went for $361,000. That was just a couple of years ago. In addition to that, maybe something a little more in our price range I'll offer you, or maybe you have one. The Wagenfeld lamp, there on the left. Uh, this lamp was named after one of the designers, Wagenfeld. It was produced in about 1923 or 24, and we have several of them at the Gropius House in Lincoln. And I, I, by the time guests on our tour have got to this point, I sort of reiterate that this is everything the Bauhaus was about. It is uh, an everyday object, beautifully designed, using modern materials, modern techniques, and it introduces one other element which the Bauhaus designers wanted to explore. And that is that it comes in component pieces. You could have yours on a glass base, but if you so desired, you could unscrew that and put it on a metal base that it came with. So that idea of you, the owner, now being able to change and affect the way your piece looks was important to the biology and the community. Thank you so much, Mary Woodward, for such an interesting lecture. I am sure many people in this audience will visit the Gropius House in Lincoln, Massachusetts soon. Mm -hmm.